This masterclass series produced by Deliberately Engaging in support of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals to build the institutions of civil society and empower people with a greater voice. Hello and welcome to this podcast. I'm Ed Davis and I'm the moderator for this masterclass series for activists on the union movement's history of struggle and achievements. The series draws on the wisdom and experience of Tom MacDonald, former ACTU Vice President and former National Secretary of the Building Workers Industrial Union, since 1992 a part of the Construction, Forestry, Maritime Mining and Energy Union. A range of current and former union leaders will join Tom and me during the series. Today, we're very pleased to have Sally McManus, Secretary of the ACTU, and Joe Schofield, National President of the United Workers' Union. This union covers workers across warehousing, defence, health, aged care, cleaning, security, and much more. Welcome Sally, Joanne, and Tom. Sally, today's podcast is on winning hearts and minds and it will explore the role of values in the union movement's broad fight to improve the quality of life for workers and their families. You published a book last year entitled On Fairness in the Melbourne University Press Small Book Series. What was your motivation for writing this book, and uh, what was your central message? Well, first of all, good day, Ed, and also to Tom. It's an honour to do this with you, Tom, and also, of course, to have Joe alongside me. Really, that book was about explaining that fairness just doesn't come about naturally. It's not something that's given to human beings. It's not something that's just the state of the world or something that governments give or employers give. It's something that has only ever been and can only ever be won or got by working people sticking together because unfairness comes when there's an equal power relationship and uh, some people exploit that unequal power relationship. So in our own history in Australia, fairness has been brought about by unions, by unions insisting on fairness in their workplace and then unions insisting on fairness in society by insisting effectively on rules or laws to guarantee it. Now, none of that's all been perfect, but if you think about things like Medicare or if you think about basic workers' rights, you think about things like education, all of these things were um, fought for by working people. And when we talk about the fair go or fairness in Australia, it's so important that we remember our history and it was we working people that brought about those things. What are examples of some of the great struggles for fairness? Equal pay for women is a really obvious one, um, which didn't come easily and didn't come quickly either. Tom is a real person to talk to about a lot of others, like for example, winning universal superannuation was started by the, the strikes of building workers as well. I mean, all of these things, like everything from health and safety laws uh, all the way through to the weekend were all parts of those struggles for fairness. You look at when did working people have the most, the biggest share of the nation's wealth? Well, it was when union membership was at its height. Seems a crazy world we're in at the moment where the government is talking about the tragedy of wage theft after years of bashing unions. Do you think they're coming to the view that we need unions to tackle wage theft? This government, no way. They're not coming to that view. <laughs> but uh, every day you, li you listen to it and you think, well, they're talking about, oh, there's all this wage theft. I wonder why that's happening. Why is it so bad? How come it's much worse than it used to be? And they're also saying, we've got record low wage growth. Why have we got record low wage growth? We can't work it out. The economists can't work it out. Oh, we've got growing inequality. Isn't this terrible? Like a concentration of power. And I just think, well, isn't it obvious that there might be something in common with all of this? The thing in common, working people's bargaining power, the fact we used to have 50% union density and now we have 15. That's the reason why there's so much wage theft, low wage growth and so much inequality. Joe, 
What attracted you to work for unions and uh, what are the values that are most important to you as a trade unionist? Thanks, Ed. It, I grew up in a, a community in Green Valley in uh, southwestern Sydney and it was a housing commission um, suburb and very working class area. Many of the families there were young families and many of them were also struggling or, you know, working very, very hard to get ahead. And that sort of gave me, a, I guess, an early introduction to what a sense of community looks like because it was very much a place where people looked out for one another um, and people stood together in tough times or if there was anybody was going through any hardship or struggle, there was a community there to support you. And for me, that's a very natural fit with what the trade union movement is and with my values as a trade unionist, you know, to ensure that, that working class people and workers have a voice and power and that they, that, you know, workers can come together and stand together to support one another. Uh, in my own union, the United Workers Union, we do extensive work with our members around our guiding values and our guiding principles. And inevitably, the thing that comes up most strongly is respect. And the real feeling for workers out there that, you know, they're not accorded enough respect and they believe that respect isn't something you should have to ask for. But increasingly, you see this disrespect displayed towards working people through wage theft, through, as Sally said, the cuts, uh, you know, the attacks on trade unions and the attacks on workers' rights to stand together collectively and advance their interests. You see this disrespect in many, many small and demeaning ways that people have to put up in things that people have put up in the workplace. So for us, it's about building that sense of respect, respect for work no matter what you do, uh, but also decency and fairness and fair treatment. People don't ask for much more than that. What are some recent examples of this lack of respect for workers that, that you're speaking about? Well, you see it play out in so many different ways and wage theft is a classic example this notion that young people are disposable uh, that they don't deserve secure work they don't deserve to be paid legally that they're a dispensable group in our economy and fodder for some of the biggest businesses most wealthy restaurant chains in the in the country they're treated like fodder you see it in the treatment of migrant workers uh, where they're used you know their visa status is used to keep them uh, insecure and compliant against what are sometimes egregious breaches uh, in their rights and you just see it in the way people, you know, speak to cleaners or yell at, at security officers. So they're all symptoms of an imbalance and, and I guess an indication of the way that the system and neoliberalism has been pushing down on the rights of working people. Yes, absolutely. Tom, how do unions put values into action? I think we need to understand how people think and how they arrive at their decisions. They are guided largely by their values. Values are important way of winning people to support the reforms we want to make Australia a better place. Uh, now, I want to answer your question by looking at how we won universal superannuation. Back in 1983, half a dozen union leaders at the ACTU level decided that the age pension could never give workers a decent retirement. And they decided that universal superannuation was the only way to do that. And they decided that workers were entitled to that as a right. So there is the first value, the union movement caring about all the workers. So when the campaign started to get underway, a clash of values took place. You had corporate values which wanted superannuation only for the elite and for the privileged and for long-term employees, whereas the union movement wanted superannuation for all workers expressed in the word universal. So workers interpreted superannuation for the elite as not for me super. But in respect of the word universal, it said to them, that's for me, super. So out of, out of that expresses itself in the workforce. When the building unions and the ACTU decided to make the first big industry scheme in the building industry, which is now called CBUS, 30,000 become members of, of CBUS. 30,000 in six months. 800 major employers joined the scheme and decided to pay superannuation premiums. 
because of the use of militant tactics in the building industry. Tom, can I just ask you, how long are you saying that that first group of workers, the building workers, how long did they go on strike to make that first breakthrough? There wasn't a general strike. There was employer-by-employer tactics because employers had to formally enrol into the scheme and sign documents, legal documents. So... We started with the big employers where we were the strongest and it gradually spread through the building industry. Once it was established there, once the flow started to take place, it became a tideway and the employers and conservative governments couldn't stop it. It was a wonderful example of the power of workers, but also you had to have a strategy to move from your strongest position where you made the breakthrough to lesser areas. And then once you couldn't go any further in the sense of union power, to then go to the Arbitration Commission and say, superannuation exists in all these industries. You should make it universal so all workers are are treated under the relative justice principle of the Commission. And that's what happened. Tom, is there a difference between how unions approach bargaining in Australia uh, and, say, the United States. And does that difference reflect a different set of values or a different way of applying those values? Well, the fundamental thing is that we had a different approach to the American trade union movement. The American trade union movement saw themselves as advancing the interest and the living standards of union members only. We had a class approach. Everything we did, we did it for all the workers, not just union members. And as a result, when the safety net of entitlements that we won come under attack with work choices, every worker was adversely affected, not only unionists. So we had the power of the whole working class challenging work choices because the whole working class was affected. Where in America, because they only concentrated on union places, as unionism declined under the under the attacks of the employ, employers, those entitlements that had been won shrunk and shrunk in the context of how many workers in American society are covered by decent wages and conditions. Sally, what place do values have in the strategies and campaigns of the ACTU? To what extent can you describe them as values-led? All the campaigns are. They're the foundation of where you start from. The bigger campaigns the ACTU would run across the movement are all to do in the end with fairness. But I think Joe makes a really important point that, you know, often this is not about people saying they want a pay rise or about 5% pay rise or 2% pay rise or a 10% pay rise. It's about being treated with respect or being treated fairly. And those values are ones that people will fight for much much longer and much harder than they will a particular figure because it's something that resonates at a at a, an emotional level not just an intellectual or a hip pocket level so our campaigns have been focused on really turning around inequality so that's making sure that workers have the rights we need in order to get fair pay rises and have secure jobs and uh, of course at the at the heart of that is fairness and it's got worse over a period of time worse since um, World War II inequality at the moment is worse than it was until after World War II and so people see it they see that unfairness and inequality all the time. So you see it with the behaviour of the banks, you see it with the bonuses of CEOs, you see it with record profits um, at the same time when people's living standards are going backwards. You see this question of fairness in America. What is Bernie Sanders talking about really? He's talking about fairness. Mm. He's talking about that every worker is important, but he's also talking about the growing injustice in America and that the problem is working people don't have the power in America. The American system of democracy is a very shallow system of democracy. It doesn't deliver results. When it comes to getting action by governments to end, uh, say, the minimum wage being as low as $7.50, or the health system being the greatest system in the world for the rich, 
and the worst system in the, for the poor. When there is virtually no safety net, why? Mm. It's about power. And workers have to understand that power exists in many forms. Our Australian trade union movement has recognised us and we've used several forms of power to achieve our safety net. And once they understand that power is the only answer, they're going to go backwards unless there's a reallocation of power and that's going to require people's action, not only union action. Well, the interesting thing about Bernie Sanders is that his values that he's expressing so clearly fly in the face of what are meant to be so-called American values about individualism and about doing it yourself and about another way of putting that is actually selfishness. And last night I was watching this video that he's produced and I have to say I was gobsmacked. It goes like this. It goes... Just imagine someone who's not like you, someone you don't know, someone you've got no connection with, that would you stand up for them? I'm calling on you to stand up for someone you don't even know who's not like you. What he was doing is he was putting in a pitch for solidarity mm. and being able to explain solidarity in such a simple but also a confronting way that is very different to, you know, what you might see on TV or your Fox News or Sky News pumped out every day. I think it's very interesting and it, it's interesting to me that we've reached this point in history where the US throws up someone like that. Yeah. Turning to you, Joe, how do you see right-wing populists, the, the shock jocks and the messages that they're getting out. How do you contrast that with what unionism is all about and the messages that unionism is trying to get out? That sort of right-wing populism hasn't come from nowhere. It's come from decades of uncertainty and that has really sown the seeds where people are, uh, in some sense, the, the attack on collective rights in the workplace, the diminishing of communities and the lack of infrastructure and support for many communities. It means that there's been a sort of fracking, if you like, of the, of the social cohesion. And it's into that space that um, the right-wing populists have been able to emerge and I think there's you know on top of those direct attacks on working class people we're now seeing these more insidious and indirect attacks like for example you know the, the use of racism as a tool to divide the working class the use of climate denialism as a tool to divide the working class these are all conscious tactics of the right to keep people polarized and to stop people from coming together um, with collective purpose in the way that you know Sally just mentioned through Bernie Sanders interview and in the way that Tom has outlined in terms of the fight for superannuation so it's into that space, that union step with the sole purpose of, of creating a collective response for working people and to be able to speak with a voice, not just for one group, but for many groups. I think the other thing to remember there is that it's very easy for the right and particularly right-wing populists to gloss over differences. Uh, but for us on the left or, or progressive people, it's much more complicated because we, we recognise and celebrate our diversity and we often speak with many voices on, on many issues and that necessarily makes it uh, messier and more complicated. And so we need to rebuild those seeds of solidarity uh, and create opportunities for working people to come together and exercise collective power, whether it's in a small workplace you know, or across a large sector like our early educators have done to draw attention to the, to the claim for equal pay. Unions are here to help foster and support that collective response. Tom, you've said that the right-wing populists and spin doctors are a threat to Australia's very system of democracy. What are you getting at? They distort the truth, hide the truth, tell outright lies, and they also use values to justify anti-worker laws. And they say, in respect of this reform, it'll create jobs. It'll create jobs. Well, now, for people, creating jobs and giving people jobs and in security of income is a noble cause. So people will support it. Our answer has to be focus on our value and debate them on our values and on our terms. And when we do that, we win the argument because people will respond to if you help them prioritise their values where they, the establishment and spin doctors, can choose the values and as a result get people 
to vote against their own interests. I was going to say a couple of things. Sometimes they contest on the same values, Tom, though, don't they? So a lot of right-wing commentators would say that they're prioritising family values and then use that to then foster division, really. So I think they are aware that that's a high level value for a, a lot, lot of people. You know, naturally humans, you know, do that. And sometimes they talk about fairness. You think of Pauline Hansen. She talks about equality and fairness, but actually she's talking about a different equality and fairness. So th- reflecting on what you said and knowing it's true, Tom, but also it's harder when they um, try and capture those same terms and say they mean you know, something very different to the way we see it. So, Sally, what do you do about that? Uh, Well, what do you reckon, Tom? Well, I reckon when they do that, they use micro examples for few people. And when they use micro arguments, it immediately says to me, we go macro. We go macro and we say, yes, it might create a few jobs, for example, as, as was in the argument about weekend penalty rates. But it will, in the big picture, be an adverse result for the vast majority. So when they argue, use a micro-argument that these people are going to be benefited, we say that they should be benefited, but the uh, reform uh, our opponents use disadvantage the great majority, so there has to be a different policy in respect of the problem of the minority. So when they go micro, we go macro. Sally... How well do you think working people understand the role of unions in creating our safety net of industrial and social entitlements? How can values help activists to reach out to workers and get them to join their union? I think that that's not well understood at all. I think if you look at younger people that they, not just younger people, people take it for granted or they think the government gave it or sometimes they believe that the employer gives it to them. So every year, even when the minimum wage goes up and 25% of the workforce benefits from that because it goes through to every award wage level, I bet a lot of people think that came about because it's some you know, remote process and that it was given to them by their employer or their government when in fact it was workers, the union movement that fought for it. If it was not for unions, there would be not those pay rises. So I think it's really important to take people right back to the basics of what a union is when you're talking to a non-member. You can't rely on a shared knowledge of what unions are in the first place, especially with young people, especially with newly arrived migrants. So um, that's just... First of all, meeting people where they are, understanding what it is that the issue that they're facing in their workplace and then linking the solving or the moving that issue forward or resolving that issue to uh, collective action or being part of a union and explaining unions simply as the act of workers deciding to join together. And by joining together, that's how you can change the situation and being able to illustrate that in a way that makes sense to them. So if you're in a, in a small workplace of 10 people, simply explaining, well, do you think that we'd get a better roster instead of just one of us going and asking if we all did it together and we all said we wanted it to change? You have to make it real in that way by explaining just the very basics that, that, that that's what a union is. It's people deciding to, to stick together. And we've learned over the years is that people are motivated by different things. We can't assume that everyone thinks the same or that everyone has uh, are true believers like activists are. And if we treat everyone like a true believer, we're not really doing them the the respect of, of listening and understanding from where they're coming from. And that's the first thing you need to do if you're if you're wanting to change people's views and to get them to join a union. You've got to first not project onto them how you would like them to be. You need to understand who who they are and what what's motivating them in the first place. So Joe, when you're when you're recruiting people, what's your message? Well, I, I agree with with what Sally said that you know, and it's very basic when you strip everything away. A union is a group of people standing together to support one another in struggle, and the best way to do that is through a relational model of organising where uh, you understand where people are at 
uh, and what their struggle is. And that's best done usually and most effectively done through workplace leaders, through people like them uh, speaking to them, uh, you know, non-members about about the unions. So, but it's also incumbent upon unions to to always check in with ourselves about what the group of workers that you're talking to want the union to be because the union can look very different. A group of workers in a highly feminised sector of the economy might look very different to a group of workers, a highly unionised and powerful men in another part of the economy. And equally, if we're to really reach into diverse pockets of the workforce, then we need to do better. Uh, in redefining what our model of unionism is around the needs of women people uh, and not a one-size-fits-all model. What does uh, doing better look like? Well, I think it's sort of sometimes starting, particularly, sorry, if you're talking to diverse groups of workers, it's starting from an understanding of their cultural experience and the ways that they might uh, choose to participate uh, in a in a collective organisation and what those models of collective action might look like. And it's actually framing that up in conversation through building relationships with those workers and their communities. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks. But Tom? I think one of the best ways of communicating with people, to not talk about things in theoretical terms, but to talk about them in human terms and talk about stories of struggles as examples of the general situation. Like superannuation was a dream once. And people back in the 80s, our opponents said it was an impossible dream. And when you tell the story how step by step that dream become closer to being realised, you start to humanise it. So we have to humanise our stories and talk about the struggles and sacrifices of their mothers and their fathers and their grandparents to create it, and it's our duty to defend it for future generations. So we use family language to talk to talk to them. It's, it's a matter of how we communicate. And with workers that are hostile to us on the grounds that we're always on strike, for example, when we meet a worker like that, we have got to change the environment of that discussion from one of confrontation, like someone said, look, I never join a union because they're always on strike and workers' families suffer and uh, their families run into debt because of strikes. How do you deal with that? Now, you can jump in and defend uh, strikes and have a confrontation or you can seek to change the environment by saying to the worker, well, look, mate, no one likes a strike. I don't like strikes and I've led strikes, and I don't know of a worker that likes a strike. So the question is not about strikes. It's about why workers go on strike. And workers go on strike for justice to realise some of their aspirations for a better life for their family. That's why they go on strike. So you change the focus from a debate about strikes that you're not going to win with that worker to a, a, a debate about fighting for justice. Once you get talking and thinking about justice and the debating, you've changed it from a confrontation to a dialogue environment. So messaging is so important, and to Sally's credit, she's a master at it, but so are our bloody opponents. They're a master at it. Sally taught me, I taught her 28 years ago uh, when she was a trainee, but Sally taught me about the power of words and the power of language and the power of getting your message right. When Sally changed the debate about underpayment of wages to wage theft, it's changed the whole approach, underpayment of wages. When we use the language of underpayment of wages, everyone said, oh, that's wrong, but it's nothing to do with me. But once you use the word theft, people go, theft is unlawful. Theft is immoral. It breaks the law. So that one word change, changed the whole atmosphere, and now even this government is saying it's going to do something about it. But 
you'll see they'll do just enough about it to have an excuse not to do much about it. Yeah, no boss will ever go to jail, that's for sure. It'll be a marketing exercise. The other thing I thought out of what you said, Tom, was that the lessons of the past and how workers won things, especially when they were told all along, you'll never win. You'll never win, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter whatever, you're never going to win it, are actually stories of hope because especially at the moment, we really need those stories of hope. One of the big things to overcome in terms of organising workers into unions is believing that change is possible in the first place. So reminding people of how hard it was in the past. Like I know when you started work, everyone was casual in your industry, weren't they? Like everyone had insecure work. No one had safety standards. No one had superannuation. No one had those basic allowances. Like back then compared to now, how hard was it to have to to, to fight for those things and to be told forever you were never going to win, but you did win. And so I think that reminding people that Forever we've been told that oh you'll you'll never you'll never win this like whether it be your boss or a government that's um they pretty much always say no until they say yes don't they? I just want to back that in and agree completely. And one of the issues Sally's raised is around hope. And the thing about organising is to you know to create for want of a better word it's about people standing together and supporting one another in struggle and believing that change is possible and then winning that change through a demonstration of their power through action through collective action and i think that's never been more important than it is today i think what gives people hope is when they believe they can win if they believe they can't win and that's what the establishment tries to do they lose hope so When we're talking about a campaign, we need to explain to the workers how we're going to build the power to win. And once they see a plan that they think is realisable, so hope blossoms. So hope is built out of belief in their, their own capacity and the union's capacity. And we use examples to show, yes, these workers believed that they could change things. And once they believed in it and they united together, they changed things. So they have to believe in themselves and they have to understand the power that they have, but that power is built on unity, it's built on solidarity, it's built on comradeship. They're the sources of workers' power. Thank you, Tom, and and that really emphasises the importance of union values. I'd like to ask you, about somebody who, in your experience, has really lived trade union values. What does this look like and what's been the impact on you? Joe? perhaps we can start with you. Well, I think we're, we're talking to him, aren't we? We've we got are. Tom McDonald we being are. on the line. <laughs> Tom is absolutely uh, one of those stellar leaders of our movement, a, a king amongst many, uh, in fact, and he has uh, not only led his own union through struggle, but he has been a visionary for so many others and so many young people. So, you know, there's countless other people. I mean, you know, there's Sally, of course, Michelle. You know, we have a great, great female leadership in our movement following on the steps of Sharon Burrow and Jed. And, you know, that's fantastic and long overdue. Uh, But I think it's also important to sort of call out to those young, vulnerable hospitality workers who courageously stood up and called out wage theft when they were being uh, underpaid and they called that out for what it was, for the theft of their wages. And I think that we have a whole generation of young people that are showing us that they are prepared to stand up and speak out and they are prepared to come together. And so that's uh, very exciting for the future. I want to um, back in uh, Jo with what she said, just add to... The fact that Tom is someone who's lived his values since he was, you know, started as a union member when he was 15 or 14, but also Audrey, his partner. It's a partnership, those two, an equal partnership long before feminism was mainstream. And they've been outsiders for so long too, like swimming against the tide at, you know, times when it was very, very hard to be a trade unionist and to hold the values that they've held. Also, in a lot of good times too, but the big thing that 
Tom's taught me and that always sticks in my mind about union values is it's about being in a union is about we, not I. And that's the most important thing. It's about us, you know, not about one person. Well, firstly, I just want to add to what Sally said, uh, we and I. 50 or 60 years ago, an old timer pulled me up when I was a boy organiser and he said to me, son, always remember that the language of the union movement is we, not I. It is not I because it does not include we. It is we because it includes I. And that's always guided me in everything I've done. I had some wonderful mentors who helped me to think and analyse things. And when I learned to analyse things, I could explain things better. So having the skill to analyse came from a number of mentors, including my mentor, Pat Clancy. But the other important thing was, was the culture of the union. And that culture was built at three levels. The culture we had in respect of how we related to one another, the leadership. So we had unity in the leadership. Then we had the culture of how we related to the leadership, related to the membership, uh, was at another level. And then we had the culture of how we related to the employers. And when you examine those cultures, they always based on values and principles. My union, for example, had a motto, if an agreement is worth making, it's worth keeping, was one of those values. Values are critical to winning a fairer Australia. What would you like activists to take away from this podcast? The only thing I'd say is that you can always pick someone that doesn't hold strong values and that some people in our political class, um, employers sometimes too, although many employers have strong values, sometimes they're just not ours, is that when tough times come and when they have to make decisions, they flail around. They don't know where to go. They don't know what direction. And when faced with pressure or faced with stress or hard decisions, they could go any way. And our values, in a way, are like an anchor, like in a storm. Like you've got that there that always holds you even in the tough times. And so values, of course, are uh, absolutely important, the bedrock of our, of our movement and who we are as a trade union movement. But it sort of also sees you through the tough times as well. We're, we're often confronted every day by a right-wing media and politics driven by neoliberalism, but we shouldn't get locked in that mindset and overlook the daily instances where we see people behave with decency and fairness. And you've only got to look at the recent bushfires and the way that the whole of the community has rallied to give you hope that the values that really do underpin uh, much of our society are fundamentally based on fairness, on decency, on equality and on giving one another a helping hand. So the problem is that the institutions that gave voice to those values, the trade union movements, you know, we've been being smashed for for many decades, but um, there's a lot of hope there in new models of organising fact that people do get it and uh, and lots of great work to be done. I say to activists, never underestimate the power of history because history answers three quarters of all the arguments you hear today. You've got examples to prove the correctness of our values and where our vision is taking Australia and you've got examples of where corporate values are taking us backwards and seeking to deny the Australia we want. All the things that are good in Australia, the union movement has been involved in most of them. All the arguments you're getting today, their history gives you an answer. So I say to activists, study particularly history that relates to your membership and, and if we do that, we'll beat the bastards. The message underlined by Sally McManus, Joe Schofield and Tom McDonald has been that values are the bedrock of the trade union movement. They're also an anchor that provides a framework for decisions and actions that enables us to get through the tough times. 
We can counter right-wing populists and win the hearts and minds of working people to support the cause of building a fairer Australia when we frame our message and tell stories that draw out our values as solidarity, social justice and fairness. As Tom said, hope blossoms when workers believe in their power and translate their values into action. And now a song to close by Chloe and Jason Roweth. They're drawing from their extensive repertoire of traditional and contemporary songs to bring you a powerful example of music used in support of progressive change. Over to you. Thanks, Ed. We'd like to start the series with The Ballad of 1891, a powerful song written by Helen Palmer and set to music by Doreen Bridges back in 1950. It describes the enormous battle over working conditions between shearing unions and the pastoralists that took place 59 years earlier. Activists have long recognised the power that song and verse and history can have in support of the ongoing struggles for change. Uh, These same values of solidarity, of fairness and social justice resonate through the years and older new generations of activists are united in solidarity, not just in the moment, but across the generations. And A bit of steel is put in the spine for progressive change that can somehow seem almost inevitable, a change within the culture, not a change done to the culture. The stories and tunes and songs are reworked and resung, and traditional music is uniquely powerful at getting inside your heart. Palmer and Bridges evoked the Battle of 1891 in the 1950s, when Australian workers were once again battling anti-union legislation under the Menzies Liberal government, and the song's been sung again and again at the battle since, and will no doubt be sung for many years to come. I'd be interested to know what this song stirs in you, what passions it gets running, what values you find in there, and see if it gets inside your heart the same way it got inside mine. Masters still, and they'll take the terms we give them, or we'll find the men who will. From Vermont to Barcolin, the shearers camps were full. Ten thousand blades were ready to strip the greasy wool. When through the west, like thunder, rang out the union's call. Sheds will be sure, Union, or they won't be shorn at all. Oh, Billy Lane was with them, his words were like a flame. The flag of blue above them, he spoke Eureka's name. Tomorrow, said the squatters. They'll find it does not pay We're bringing our free labourers To get the clip away Tomorrow said the shearers They may not be so keen We can mount three thousand horses To show them what we mean Then we'll pack the west with troopers From Burke to Charles Towers You can have Fill off speeches, but the final strength be is down to your six shooters, your troopers and police. The sheep are growing heavy, the burr is in the fleece. And if Norden, Felt, and Gatling won't bring you to your knees, we'll find a law the squatters said that's made for times like. Fourteen men were brought The judge had got his orders The squatters on the court But for everyone that's sentenced Ten thousand won't forget 
When they jail a man for striking, it's a rich man's country yet. This masterclass series has been produced by Deliberately Engaging, the support of the Committee to Defend Trade Union Rights, and of Tony and Nina Bleasdale is gratefully acknowledged. I hope you'll join us on the next episode of this masterclass series for empowering activists. I'm Ed Davis. Bye for now.